Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna go through the different types of shock. So, how does shock occur? Well, shock is the result of a decrease in blood pressure. If your blood pressure drops down, it means that the appropriate amount of blood is not reaching your tissues to give it oxygen and nutrients. And this is called decreased perfusion, so non-adequate perfusion. If your tissues are under-perfused, it means no oxygen, no nutrients, they can't make ATP or energy, and therefore those tissues are becoming ischemic and then ultimately can become necrotic and die. So basically, shock being decrease in blood pressure results in decrease in perfusion of tissues and organs, which results in ischemia and results in necrosis. We want to avoid this at all costs and there's different types of shock which we're going to go through and you can classify these different types of shock on this particular equation. This is the equation that determines the blood pressure. Now blood pressure has to be maintained obviously and if blood pressure drops it's because one of these two things have dropped or both of them have dropped. Vice versa, if blood pressure goes up it's because one of these two things have gone up or both of them have gone up. Let's break it up. What is this first thing here? Well, this is known as cardiac output. This is the amount of blood that we eject from the heart every minute. Cardiac output is defined by the heart rate, so how quickly the heart beats, multiplied by the stroke volume, which is how much blood the heart ejects every contraction. So if you've got the heart contracting and squirting out blood every contraction, heart rate is how quickly it does this, and stroke volume is how much blood is being ejected every time it contracts. Together, that gives you cardiac output, how much blood is being ejected every minute. Now, SVR is systemic vascular resistance. This is how much resistance the blood is experiencing as it moves through the blood vessels. Obviously, if a blood vessel constricts and narrows the lumen of the hollow tube, that means the diameter reduces, it's harder for blood to move through and the systemic vascular resistance goes up. If a blood vessel dilates, it's easier for blood to move through, systemic vascular resistance decreases and therefore blood vessel diameter can contribute to blood pressure. So when we look at shock, if there's a decrease in blood pressure, which is basically what can result in shock, it's because something's happening with either heart rate, stroke volume or systemic vascular resistance. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's break up the different types of shock. Firstly, I'm going to talk to you about shock that sits underneath cardiac output. So the type of shock that sits underneath cardiac output, first of all, if we have a look, is going to be hypovolemic shock. Now hypo means below, volemic means volume. This is just saying that the circulating fluid volume of the body is reduced. Now this could be blood or this could be non-blood volume such as plasma for example. Now if we have a look why would we reduce blood volume or how could this happen? Well predominantly this can happen through hemorrhage, right? So for example, you can have a GI bleed, postpartum hemorrhage, trauma. You could also lose fluid a number of different ways such as an abdominal aortic aneurysm. If we look at non-blood fluid, you could lose this non-blood fluid through vomiting, through diarrhea, through polyuria, increased urination, which can happen with diabetics, for example. Too much glucose, too much water pulled into the urinary tract, and therefore too much excess urine being excreted. So these are some examples. Another one for non-blood flu can be burns. A very important one. So while these are the causes of reducing blood volume, what ends up happening ultimately is if the volume drops, it means that the amount of blood being ejected every contraction drops. This is the problem, this is where it sits 
in the equation is that the stroke volume drops. Now what you need to think about is compensation because of homeostasis, every time something drops down, we wanna bring it back up. If it goes too high, we wanna bring it back down. How can the body compensate for this drop? If that drops and everything else remains the same, blood pressure is gonna drop. So we need to increase blood pressure by obviously increasing one or more of the remaining factors in this equation. And this is what happens. You have hypervolemia, your heart rate increases and individuals can present with tachycardia. As the body is trying to pump harder and faster, 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 doesn't really make a difference because the stroke volume is lower. It's not gonna help, but this is what the body does to try and compensate. Another thing that it does is it constricts blood vessels. If it constricts blood vessels, blood backs up and hopefully increases that blood pressure. But if this happens for too long, organs will not get their blood under perfusion or hyperperfusion, and therefore will ultimately die. So this is the compensatory mechanism. So how can you fix this? Well, treatment options would be to address the reduction in fluid volume. So blood or non-blood fluids, and this is going to be predominantly maybe an IV sort of intervention. All right, next type of shock that sits underneath cardiac output is going to be cardiogenic shock. Cardio meaning heart, genic means this is where it originates. So this is a problem with the heart itself. Now the heart is a muscular pump that pushes blood around the body. So if there's a problem with that pump, what's gonna happen is either, so let's reset this. If there's a problem with the pump, either the heart rate has dropped down or the st stroke volume has dropped down or maybe both. Regardless, cardiogenic shock will result in a decrease in cardiac output. What causes cardiogenic shock? Well, any abnormality, abnormality with the heart that stops it from working as a pump. So for example, it might be heart failure. It might be MIs, myocardial infarctions. It could be myocarditis, inflammation of the heart tissue itself. It could be a stenotic valve, not letting blood move from one place to another. Anything that really stops that heart from working like a pump. So, compensation. If these two are dropped, it means cardiac output's dropped. The only thing we can really play around with here is going to be the systemic vascular resistance. So what happens in individuals with cardiogenic shock? The compensatory mechanism, blood vessels constrict predominantly to the periphery, so arms and legs, limbs for example, and the individual can feel cold and the limbs can feel cold as a manifestation. How do you fix this? Well, you need to fix the underlying issue with the heart, and there could be a multiple, multitude of approaches here in order to treat cardiogenic shock. Let's now have a look at the type of shock that sits underneath systemic vascular resistance. First type I want to talk about is septic shock. Septic shock occurs when a bacteria or a fungi, for example, releases a toxin that damages the cells of the body that releases a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory chemicals. Now, because septic shock's sitting underneath systemic vascular resistance, the ultimate outcome has something to do with the blood vessels, right? Let's have a look. So septic shock can occur if positive, gram-positive, let's write gram-positive, if gram-positive, bacteria or gram-negative bacteria or some types of fungi are in the blood, they can release toxins. So for example, gram-negative bacteria can release endotoxins, which are called lipopolysaccharides, and gram-positive can release exotoxins, sometimes called enterotoxins. And fungi, again, can release a multitude of different types of toxins. Now what they do is they affect cells, they damage cells. And when you damage cells, you release a whole bunch of chemicals. Some of these chemicals can include histamine, prostaglandins, leukotrienes. And what these do is they can travel to the blood vessel and they result in a pro-inflammatory response, which means the blood vessel dilates and becomes quite porous and then the blood fluid 
will leak out, losing blood fluid because the dilation in the blood vessel means it can't maintain vascular resistance and fluid can leak out. This means that systemic vascular resistance in septic shock decreases and the compensatory mechanism will be and trying to increase that heart rate, trying to increase that stroke volume. So the heart rate may start to increase in these individuals with septic shock. How do we treat this? Well, antibiotics if it's a bacterially induced case. So that's gonna be main treatment mechanism. The next type of shock I wanna look at that sits underneath systemic vascular resistance is going to be that of anaphylactic shock. So anaphylactic shock is an allergic response It's an allergic response and it can be caused by a drug, it could be caused by um, uh, some sort of allergen, for example, and what can happen is this results in what we call an antigen, which is a protein released into the body, which ends up becoming recognized by certain types of cells and they end up spitting out a certain type of B cell ultimately called an IgE antibody. So the IgE antibody ultimately produced by cells that recognize this antigen as being foreign. These B cells produce this IgE and what IgE does is it tells mast cells to release histamine which is the major player here and other pro-inflammatory chemicals. Some of which we spoke about here with sepsis. And a similar scenario occurs in which the blood vessel dilates, you can't maintain systemic vascular resistance, you increase the vascular permeability, which results in a drop in blood pressure because systemic vascular resistance drops. And again, the body tries to respond by increasing heart rate and increasing stroke volume to no effect. How would you treat this anaphylactic shock? Well, you want adrenaline and you'd want antihistamines predominantly. All right, the last type of shock I wanna talk about here is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock tells you that neuro meaning nervous system, genic meaning the origin like cardiogenic. So neurogenic shock is an issue with the nervous system. And predominantly the issue here occurs in individuals who have suffered a spinal cord injury. And the spinal cord injury affects the autonomic nervous system, more specifically the sympathetic nervous system, which helps us constrict blood vessels and increase blood pressure. So in times in which blood pressure is dropped, and we want to increase it, we want to activate the sympathetic nervous system, calming down our spinal cord, telling blood vessels to constrict, increasing blood pressure. It doesn't work because the injury site has damaged the fibers that innervate the blood vessels. And so what the response is, is that the blood vessels end up dilating because they can't constrict, and when they dilate, the systemic vascular resistance drops. So what you see in these scenarios is that you've got different types of shock, some that sit under cardiac output, some that sit under systemic vascular resistance. Ultimately what happens in shock is that whether it's playing around with cardiac output or systemic vascular resistance, the outcome is the blood pressure drops. Drop in blood pressure, drop in tissue perfusion, less oxygen, less nutrients, and over time that tissue can die. And this is a quick run through of shock.